On today's program, we'll look at some of the amazing design features found in animals which have led to human inventions. From flight to high-speed gears, birds which can migrate amazing distances, to squids using glowing bacteria to become invisible to predators. God's creative genius is astounding. Gradual mutational changes over long periods of time fail to explain any of this stunning complexity. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Creative Creatures Part 2 with Bruce Malone. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Bruce Malone, earned a degree in chemical engineering and has 27 years experience as a research leader with the Dow Chemical Corporation while holding 17 patents for new products. In 2008, he became the executive director of Search for the Truth Ministries. This organization distributes Bible-affirming creation materials to students and prisoners internationally, giving away thousands of resources. Bruce speaks on the scientific evidence supporting creation at schools and churches around the world and has authored seven books on this subject. Welcome to the program, Bruce. Ray, it's a great pleasure to be here. Creative Creatures Part 2, what will we be looking at today? Well, let's recap for a second. In Part 1, we looked at God commanded mankind to take dominion or have control over creation. And I've always thought, why did God do that? Because we mess it up. We either end up worshiping creation or we end up wasting creation. So why would God give us control? Well, I've come to the conclusion there's two primary reasons. One is that by studying the creatures God has made, we will absolutely know they couldn't have made themselves. So it, they point toward God. Today we're really gonna talk about the second primary reason that God gave us control over creation. And there's a Bible verse that points to that. It's from Job, and in this verse it says, Ask the beasts and they shall teach thee. We can learn so much from studying creation. So that's what we're going to look at. What can we learn by looking at the creatures God has made? Man has dreamed about flying for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I mean, who among us as a small child didn't put your arms out and just want to fly, you know? Who didn't have dreams about flying? Mm. Who hasn't built paper airplanes oh. hoping, <laughs> you know, we could fly? Mm. We've tried and tried and tried throughout the millennia. As a matter of fact, I think it has taken 5,800 years mm. from the moment Adam and Eve were created, and biblically it puts it in the range of 6,000 years ago, mm -hmm until 1903, we were trying and trying and trying. We developed photography back in the mid 1800s. At the time of the Civil War, we had the old tin types. And in the late 1800s, we were stringing them together to make movies. And some of the early cinematographers captured mankind's early attempts at learning to fly. So what was the common thread as you watched that little clip? 
It looked like they were trying to be birds. Birds and wings. <laughs> Every attempt had wings yep. or birds flapping and so on. Now, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because we did not yet understand the principles of flight. We saw creatures that could fly, but it wasn't until the Wright brothers really started to understand the principle of getting a certain shape, the shape of bird's wing moving fast enough through air, what it actually happens as this parabolic shape moves through air, the air moves faster along the top surface, forming a low pressure area. There's higher pressure below, which actually causes the wing to lift and very enormous airplanes could then fly, but they have to get it moving fast enough. You see, the Wright brothers were Christians, strong Christians. Their father was a pastor, and they believed we could learn from creation. If God did it, there's principles there we could learn. Now, I want to show you the very first film in 1903. That's only about 115 years ago of mankind flying with powered flight above the air. Now, the first flight, only Orville climbed on. He went a few hundred feet and landed. They went, got newspaper reporters, came back the next day. You'll see both Orville and Wilbur climbing on the plane and an enormous weight dropping down that propels the plane forward. I didn't realize that, but that's what gave them enough speed. And it's thrilling. What you're about to witness is mankind's first real flight after th almost 6,000 years of attempting to do so. it. And they're not just flying in a straight line. They're soaring and they're banking and they're turning and they're coming in for a landing within days of learning to fly. They're already controlling their flight. Now, none of that would have happened had we not studied the design of a bird's wings. You know, it's amazing. The, the, when you first look at those sort of failed attempts, and how in, in sort of a crude, gross way they were imitating birds, but it wasn't until the Wright brothers really looked much more specifically, right. much more closely at the birds and the details came out that we began to see the clear evidence for design. But I also believe that's exactly right. They trusted because there's a design, there's a designer, we can learn from that design. And that we can their, even imitate it. Their Christian worldview was key to their following through and their tenacity. Yeah of learning to fly. The knowledge is out there. We just it have is. to take God at his word and really begin to study and see what he's done. Exactly. We started studying other birds like the Swift. It actually led to improved airplane efficiency. You see, the Swift is the fastest bird in level flight. It flies in level flight at 104 miles per hour. No other bird's been tracked that fast in level in flight. In level flight, not it's like diving. Or, it's like you're driving yeah. along in a car at 80 miles an hour and you're looking over your shoulder hoping the police don't come. <laughs> this bird's gonna come zipping by you like you're almost standing still on level flight. It flies almost continuously during its entire life. They've tracked these birds. They believe they fly the equivalent of 2.5 million miles. One bird. One bird. That's like eight times, all the way to the moon, around the moon, and back again, and then do it seven more times. Or the equivalent of 100 times around the Earth during their lifetime. Because they, they, they drink while they fly. They don't stop. They love to fly too much. Swoops down, takes a drink, and keeps flying. I've seen them do this. It's really cool. They sleep while they're flying. That's an interesting They trick. close <laughs> one eye, shut down half their brain, it sleeps, then they open that eye, shut down the other half of their brain, and they sleep while they're flying. I think some people do that while I'm preaching sometimes. 
<laughs> they make babies while they're flying. They don't wow. stop because they don't like to stop flying. The only time they really stop is to have a nest and to, to, to take care of the eggs. They love to fly. So what do we study as we're looking at how do you make your planes faster, more efficient, more maneuverable? We look at the way their wings are shaped. All these early airplanes, wings were straight out, the Wright Brothers plane, World War I by airplanes, World War II planes, the early airliners, the wings are straight out. But as they got faster and faster, look at all modern airplanes. Their wings are swept back like the swift swing. And that has literally been attributed by the design of this bird. One last example with flight. Now we're moving faster, we have to land these big airplanes safely. The most hazardous maneuver in air flight is the takeoff and landing because you're moving fairly slow. If you don't get these enormously heavy machines moving fast enough, they'll lose lift and they'll flutter like a leaf. They'll, they'll stall and they'll crash. Many crashes are because of that. We started looking at birds. We found out the big birds of prey have little forward feathers. You see them right here, mm. that come out only during landing. And they allow an increase in lift so they can slow down without losing that lift. What did we do for all airplanes as we looked at these birds? We put forward flaps on the wings because the birds did it first. That's where the principle came from. See, all of modern flight that led to everything, every, everything we see in the world today all the industries tied to flight are because we learned from the birds. So we looked at what God did and how it works for the creature. We imitated it and suddenly we can do the same Correct. things. That's exactly right. Amazing. Yep. Let's look at some other creatures. By the way, all of these and all sorts of examples from geology and astronomy and genetics, all areas of science every day of the year are in a book called Explore the World. These books are given away in school systems in foreign countries. The American version, same book inside, is called Have You Considered Evidence Beyond a Reasonable Doubt? Another page in that book talks about another bird. This one's called the Bar-Tailed Godwit. It's on page September 29th. Each day is a different topic. Uh, now, I, I think I kind of like this because it's not called the Bar-Tailed Evolution Wit. <laughs> it's called the Godwit. What makes this bird so amazing? Because of what he can do. You see, this bird, in the summer lives in Alaska, way up here in Alaska. Okay, it's circled already. But in the winter, he has to fly to New Zealand. It is a 7,000 mile journey over open ocean. So he has to take off from Alaska and never stop because he's not a water bird, he's not a waterfowl. If he stops, he's gonna drown. He won't even be able to take off from the water. So it he, has to stay in the air all that time. It has to stay time. in the air the whole time. Wow. From five to seven days, he travels an average of about 50 to 70 miles an hour. Five to seven days continuously Continuously flapping flight. his wings, continuously. Wow. Now, this is how he does it, okay? He has to fly 7,000 miles for five to seven days. Turns out, every flap of his wing takes up energy. Where does that energy come from? It comes from the fat stored in his body. The cells contain fat, and it gets used up with every flap of the wing. So he has to increase his body weight by 55% or he can't carry enough payload, enough fuel to get there. So he knows before he takes he's, off, he's got to eat he's a bunch eat of food. and eat and eat. But there's a problem. If he eats that much, he starts looking like the Goodyear blimp. Okay, he's not very aerodynamic. The blimp doesn't move very fast. Seems like a catch-22, Bruce. It he does. needs more food for more energy, but the more food he gets, the heavier the he is. Uh, so man, what do you do? We all have that problem, don't yes. we? Yes. <laughs> well, God provided the answer because he designed this bird to do what it does. Once it reaches the weight it needs, all of its internal organs shrivel up. Its liver, its stomach, its kidneys, its intestines, even its heart, they compact and shrivel into a very small space so he becomes more streamlined. The type of fat he makes is highly concentrated with a very low water content so he's not packing a bunch of water with him as he flies. And between those two things, he has just enough fuel to make the journey. So his body 
knows to do this somehow. Because it's designed into the DNA of that creature, and it's the only creature we know of that will do this thing with its body in order to be able to accomplish what he accomplishes. So Bruce, if this creature was 75, 80% evolved to do this, I mean, it seems to me like it's ditching in the ocean somewhere around New Guinea. Exactly. He dies, no babies, no more godwits. They're dead, they're extinct. It all has to be there, all of those abilities all to begin with. Before he takes Before off, he, takes he, that first he has to be able to make it and he, and he has to be able to... And he has to navigate that whole way. He has to know where to get there over open ocean. All of it's programmed into his ability. Amazing creature. Do evolutionists even have a big way to try to explain that? Do they just... Uh, honestly, they, they, they're, they're, they will look at something like this and they'll say, look at the marvelous abilities that this animal has look at what evolution has created. They throw the word evolution, evolution. at it. It's useful that he's able to shrivel his fat, so he must have evolved that. It's useful that it's a highly concentrated fat and he can shrivel his organs, so he must have evolved that. And that's really as far as the thinking goes. Now, let's look at one more example, the bobtail squid. This is a creature that lives in the ocean and he literally has an invisibility cloak. You, you see, he, lives kind of high in the ocean, it comes out in the evening, gathers plankton to eat, but fish love to eat the bobtail squids. They're like little Twinkies to other fish, okay? <laughs> well, they'll look up, see one, and they'll eat it. How's he gonna keep from being eaten? He grabs bioluminescent bacteria, stores them in special organs on his underside of his body, and then in a full moon, he reveals all of these microorganisms so he looks like the moon when creatures are looking up at him. There are clouds that cover the moon. He shields them so that the bioluminescence disappears. If it's a half moon, he only allows half of them to show up. And he'll dump all the bacteria at the end of the evening so that they'll regrow the right amount for the next evening. So this creature, which is in the shallow water, so the fish are underneath yes. that want to eat him, They're the predators, see him. they look up and it knows. They think they see the moon. Yeah, it, it makes itself invisible. Yeah, he, he's got kind of like an invisibility stealth cloak. bomber a stealth octopus. stealth bomber squid. <laughs> yeah. So, last little creature we're gonna talk about is the leaf hopper. This guy, when he jumps, he accelerates 100 G-forces. What does that mean, Bruce? Well, when you drop a ball, it accelerates real fast down to the ground. That's one G, one times acceleration of gravity. Test pilots or astronauts, when they're taking off, when they hit about 10 Gs, 10 times as fast as a ball will drop, they're in danger of blacking out. So they literally test them in centrifuges that spin them around and around to see can they withstand it. Here's what 10 G forces looks like on the human body. Wow. It's pushing their entire face backwards, they're moving forward so fast. Well, this little insect, he takes off 100 Gs. 10 times faster than humans can withstand. A human wouldn't survive. Well, there's a bigger problem than that. You see, he's walking through the forest, dum 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 dum, -dum the little leaf hopper, and his brain says, jump. The signal has to go down to his legs. That, we know how fast the signal moves. We know how fast the legs will contract. And it's impossible for that nerve signal to hit both legs fast enough for both legs to move at the same time. One of them's gonna move a little quicker than the other. But then he's going to go off to the well, side, he's right? He's taking off like a bullet out of a gun. That's the visual. He's like a bullet coming out of a gun. What happens if one of his legs shoves a little quicker than the other? He's going to just... He'll go sideways. His brain's going to hit the tree because he's not going straight. Fly over the forest. No more leaf hopper. Scientists are thinking, how does he move in a straight line? How does he get both legs to move perfectly in unison? Well, they studied this. Deep down inside of the little nymph, the little baby leaf hopper that moves this fast, this is what they found. Two perfectly formed gears, one attached to the right leg, one attached to the left leg. So if one leg starts to move, both legs have to move in perfect unison. Those gears weren't made by mankind. They're made inside of an insect. If this thing is is evolved or developed at 90%, it's, it's, it still won't work. It won't work. The legs won't move, the insect's gonna die. So this entire gear system is going to have be to be all complete. there. The ligaments, the gear, the pitch, the angle, the length of the, the fins, everything. You see, it all has to be perfect or nothing works. Now an evolutionist will look at that and it'll say, wow, look what evolution created because it's useful. But it, it, that's just a word. It doesn't explain it unless small changes could make it happen. 
You see, pretend there's an insect that just has not a gear, a pre-leaf hopper, just a, some sort of a little round little protein. How are you going to turn it into a gear? It would be like hitting this nut with a hammer. I'm going to make a nick. I'm going to make a change. That's a mutation. I hit it again. Another mutation. 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 I might even form little fins. But unless they're all perfect and perfectly aligned, it's useless. It's detrimental. Origins, we're talking to Bruce Malone, who's been sharing about creative creatures. Part two, Bruce, we've been looking at some amazing examples of design. And specifically, the things we could learn from them. We ended up talking about the leaf hopper, the two gears that are inside that little baby nymph or uh, immature insect that allows the legs to move in unison. We're actually studying the design, the pitch, the angle of those gears in order to produce high speed gears for human machines. We're looking at the animals God has made to learn how they're designed. You see, God has given us a, um, what I like to call a scientific model to understand the past. No scientist has a time machine. No scientist can go back in the past and see what's happened. Those are historical sciences, geology, uh, astrophysics. They're all speculating on what's happened in the past. And you can come to two starting points, either Things are there because God has been involved and he's told us what has happened, or they've all made themselves. It's all happened by natural, random type processes. And if you start with one set of thinking, you're gonna to come to one conclusion. If you start with the other set of possible thinking, that there's a designer behind it all, God exists, and he's told us what has happened, you'll come to a different conclusion. We all have the same rocks, the same data, the same fossils, but we have to figure out how are we going to interpret those things? For instance, the very first chapter of the Bible says 10 times God created creatures to reproduce after their own kind. Fish make fish, birds make birds, trees make trees. See, that's the very foundation of biology. If we leave that out of your thinking, we're gonna misinterpret biology. And that's all that's going on. It's not that teachers, professors, textbooks are stupid. They're simply leaving God and what he's told us out of their thinking so they misinterpret it. If people weren't created, something turned into a person. If fish weren't created, something turned into a fish. So they just make up a story, evolution, to pretend it all happened. The second big event that the Bible gives us as a model that God has been very specific about is that death is here because of our actions. It hasn't always been around. And sin, rebellion, evil has to have a penalty. Has to, there has to be payment or God's not just. But what about the rocks? What about the fossils? This is a trilobite. It's an animal that used to be alive, now it's solid rock. The rock layers are filled with trillions of these. Where'd they come from? The Bible again gives us a model. It spends more time talking about a world restructuring deluge, flood, and we find stories of this flood in cultures throughout the ancient world. The Egyptians, the Peruvians, the Alaskans, the Russians, all of them have stories of an ancient flood that covered the earth. And when we look at the rock layers, we realize this is what created the rocks rapidly and recently. So all those millions of years are just a story that leaves out the reality of the past. Then people spread out across the earth and the most momentous event of all the universe the one who made the universe entered into it as a human being. He died in our place to take that penalty of death that we deserve upon himself. And he promised over and over and over again, he is going to return someday. So these are the, the enormous God-involved events of history. When you leave them out of your thinking, you're going to misinterpret the past. This isn't just about science and you know a bunch of interesting little cutesy things God made. 
if you leave out the reality that the Bible means what it says at the beginning, all of the rest of scripture becomes distorted. And that's exactly where we're at today. People are ignoring the Bible because they're distorting and ignoring what it says about the beginning. Well, I love what you do, Bruce, that you look at creation and you say, look, let's look what the creation itself says. Let's look at the evidence. Does it support That's this right. biblical view? And I think what we're seeing over and over again is that, yes, it absolutely does. Bruce, I want to thank you for being on the program today. It's been a real pleasure. It has been a pleasure. And thank you for joining us. We look today at how we can study creation and not only learn the design that God has put into creatures, but also imitate that design in order to prosper and advance in human life. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof it's all around you. Well, if you enjoy Origins, we could sure use your help to keep this Creation TV program on the air. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time and people to make programs like this, and we would love for you to prayerfully and financially support us. It makes a big impact. Let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator is. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling. And write to Origins Program, number 1910, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.